dead color. I had just finished painting the still life when it began to move, which in truth it had been doing all along, and at once I found I had been doing great violence all along the seams of tulips, the dusky grapes who sang to the birds outside, the lemon-sized body of a bird who lobbed herself at the window, and both I and the painting began to rot like a cantaloupe, that is to say from the inside and with temerity, and holding the painting to my softening body, I saw that garden that spends its life open-mouthed in jungle increase in the biblical work of unguarded heat. and I'll be reading two poems that appear in the new issue of Sprung Formal. The first poem is called The Snow Geese. The Snow Geese. Today I watched the snow geese congregating like table salt, like dandruff. For how many days has it been since I've washed my hair, since I've washed the rusted grease of sloth off of me, rinsed clean and culpable, downy as the feathers my mother fed me as a child, veins, barbs, quill and all. Greedy girl, greedy geese, flooding the air like drafts of paper toothy first. Once I engulfed 12 persimmons with the flame of my teeth, the little hearts pulped in the hot precision of greed. Persimmons sliding down my chin, sweet, ruddy, neat, mercy. Today, I fed the snow geese specks of my life, worry lines, perilous laughter, debts in flocks of several hundred thousand migrations. Flapping to and fro, my family lulls in the open mouth of labor. Each jagged tooth without insurance, each grain of rice swaddled in each beckoning beak. Drool, spit, peck, want. Mass exodus, mass arrival. The snow geese are nasal in their wanting. I watch them eat roots and tubers from inside my car. What right do I have to want anything? Their eating is not ration, not take only what you need. I think of the now, of stores now, hollow of rice, beans, tomato sauce, toilet paper, what kills that which we are afraid of. Are you afraid of me, greedy girl? Greedy geese, eating, 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 eat, eating, 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 eating. In the field across, I smell a cow's fear, masticating, watching the geese, ripe and green shit ripe in fecund relation. White wings rack my ears open. In this country, who must worm their way through the wreckage? Hot. Seeking shade, I went into the barn. The air swirled with flecks of hay and the flickering fly wings, like some face I used to love ghostly in the low lingering, my loneliness lodged somewhere in the slowly collapsing coppola. I fanned myself with myself, my hands chicken flapping, useless sweater of self pilling with sweat. Was I thinking about licking myself clean? It wasn't the 90 degree weather. It wasn't the leaping downpour the night before the air left mute with mugginess. It wasn't your time yet my mother told me over the crackling phone. Lightning, are you taking your time? Lately, I've been conjuring what I desire, witchy with wands, gathering the pearly shells of some future life in which there is no leaving, no being left, no forgetting the face of love. Since I was a child, I've been stricken with daydreaming, little bacteria of hope. Lima bean clouds, rat queens, hunched hills, like the backs of my grandparents I pummel to massage. A dream daughter whose eyes shine like mine, fierce, hot, bat. In the barn, I sit down on a bundle of hay, let my legs kick and scythe. 
Where is this heat coming from? Where does the heart lay down its anchor? I feel something pawing at my back, a stethoscope touch. A barn cat presses against me, blinking a flea from its eye like a semicolon, an endless sentence. Keep this heat. Hi, I'm Noah Falk, and I'm going to read my poem, The Kid's Drawing. A dark spill, not meant to trigger loneliness, is where the eye goes first. Then an interval of frozen trees, pulsing in an oh my gosh wind. Lines rivered into an almost collapse. A dirty smile or tiny meadow, coffee stained on top of the person-shaped thing. Legs crammed quickly as if running, but also standing still. The skin a cut open star, a bruise, or a pond maybe, with a single cloud paused overhead. And then the sun, a dull, haunted thing at the center where all seasons meet. Goons Romance My goons are fighting in the yard as usual. I only wished I could leave the house. Shirts off, men grabbing for each other's breaths with clubs and fists in the cool gardens. I encouraged occasional bloodlust. It was a condition they should maintain precise face shadow. I liked that. Payday brought too many questions from the accountant, but I had responsibility for all of my goons, and he was a simple bride. Every week, the minivan rolled slow, cautious to the edge of the property. Goons made a habit of drowning the driver. Severe postures, entwined, unfolding, shoved inside the minivan transport for road-killed miles. New faces cropped up among older, familiar. Blameless bodies rubbed asunder in heat and baby oil. The tenor of low-income housing invaded nascent habitats, my home. Understand I am not that wealthy, just well off. The goons clambered out in pairs, ready-made labor, but I could not leave the house in daylight. Too much heat to greet them. Not fear, not misgivings. Some call it superpower. I was unsure about playing the victim. I paid lump sums for their keep, watched them raise tents by my duck pond like mercenaries. Arrived per the delivery instructions at 4 p.m. I saw them through the blinds in the telescope. My goons accepted a mark which was a word meaning division. I used tools from the brown leather case I carried to different sites. My business was loyalty. I turned and branded the men by moonlight. The screen built an uninspected fervor in my incisions. Comrades, pawns, underfed, indulged. The goons stoked the pacings in my art. I recognized the impermanence of community, drew out the suffering moments between initiates. I cherished my goons despite their crying orphan pleas. Started at the waist, working up, smiled. The music stayed entrancing to our world, our gala of painted red. I watched my knives go scaly with their material. We followed a flagrant set, unimportant except for my lessons, and the goons counted on my powerful candor. I fingered the edge of their witness. Goon body resilient in this devotion, what kept them coming back? It's a huge concern that my goons witness flailing knuckles, splitting flesh, we locked the doors, a collection of goons, to witness the sacred design. 
My goons drove the limousine around the downtown shopping district. I expected beggars. I watched businesses going out, looting. The doors were closed everywhere. New efforts must have been rushed, excluding masses of savory idiots. And the city was wrecked in fires and my goons laughed. Today I refused penance. I snacked, snuffed out bitter lives in my Tetris grip. I found a distant pleasure in milking throats. Here, thieves threw themselves off stories, hoping against change. Unrequited, and lots of goons still lived in the city so they knew the spots. I gratefully stopped corners. At sunrise, this goon cluster made end jokes and plans. I meant to discourage bonding. I kept up my villainous intone. I listened to professional coaching. The tiny inroads were paid by the dusters my goon wore, and the, cu- and the country winds chasing their delimbed bodies, their optimistic haircuts. I leaned my head against the cool barrier of the tinted window, feeling loathsome in my evening wear. I felt more like myself slipped in gore. Hi, my name is Jamie. This is called Quantum Tantrum. At one point in development, Pac-Man was Chomsky. The week I was born, the number one song was Send in the Clowns. End of February, the first half inch of daffodils don't defile a thing. They say we are 20 days ahead towards spring, which almost gets us whole. We're three weeks late with everything, but whatever little purple vents the violets opened in the earth must have done their work because one dove on the phone line blows its pop bottle vowel. And just like that, we're all still here. A mile off vulture slow scoots its cone of carrion scan. And I could care less more often, which is just boredom and a big problem. Bigger still, there might not be a single poem in it, but the jobs work the spine of the notebook, strengthen your core. Pry, encrypted ear, a prayer, dagoon, Yon god dog do agony. Nod and go, your life is any good, yo. Carface, some terrifying cartoon evil from childhood. What animal was it? What strand of phantom hair teasing my throat brushes my cheek invisibly until I remember him leering on Pinterest Lily broke up with her first boyfriend because he was short, 
hopes to grow Theo taller than me as a precaution against breakups, as if Jean's had nothing much to say. Forfeited treatments, hospice age 27. Camo lining the casket implies a return to nature. Open season. Forfeited a game, a big game animal, perhaps even a crime. Age 27, I too am surprised I am not the animal I expected. Just breathe. What's real, what's real, oh me, what's oh me in the water, what's breaking down the wood? White, noise, black, screen, rain, thunder sounds rain, on window, with thunder, mother, baby, soft, white, Mozart studying noise, alpha waves, stress, relief, remove, mental blockages, subconscious, negativity. What's caught in the toilet? What block in the sinuses? By flashlight revealed a small box of Vaseline implicating Theo. Bailing the bowl down to dregs of brown water with a measuring cup, a true friend. Unlocking energy hidden chains of carbon. Don't think I am hungry anymore. I am high. Speed chemicals expanding. Gases given off as heat. Given off as light. My name is Jillian A. Fanton, and today I'm going to be reading my poem, The TSA Agent. In the interest of air safety and my own personal arousal, the U.S. government cradles me like he cannot. Find me, officer. Find me a bomb threat with blue latex fingers. Birth a second Venus from time's forgotten testy with every flat palm press. A broken paper clip shrieks under my denim. She thumbs it up, my front pocket freed. The bins tumbleweed across the conveyor. Be sure you have all of your personal items. Wallet, summer sweated peacoat, laptop and case. All of your personal items. Sandpaper hands, limp and lifeless. Personal items. Four hours of couponed vodka crayons and a stubborn chuck wagon cursing her failure to stop me. The Wild and Merciless Arrows You might describe grief like this. Give it a place to land somewhere between the path that opens across the beach and the pier damaged by September's storm. I know you didn't like watermelon 
for its texture and, in the end, wouldn't have really seen the waning gibbous moon. I couldn't say, begin to know how to reply when you said the children would never forgive you if you died. You're dead. You wanted to shave your hair, take charge before they put you in another tube, pump the drugs through your hand, and then I called some funeral home from my spot in the sand, having not even the clarity to think how those were the days and hours we'd last know together. A circle in my mind burst from its yellow, dusty bowl into a dazzling blue, leaning hard into white as though a cloud fled clear from the eye of the most brilliant sun. It wasn't yet time for the redwoods to burn, and eventually your body too, each territory of skin, the tumors with nowhere left to hide, while the rest of us get away clean, live today and again tomorrow. Magnitude explained. Just this last Friday, I found myself wearing out the highway, passed by trucks full of boar semen and petroleum, sand, families. I was born on a Friday too hot, breached through a cut made to calm my forehead or my heel the first to go. Then the hours of the day changed. Then the weather ate itself. I let myself outside to wallow. Outside, all I know is this triptych of billboards crowning the Walgreens. In the wind and dark, it looks so like a Gerhard Richter triptych that I have to toss half a cigarette to come inside and find a book I knew had Richter, whose name I sadly couldn't recall in its index. The wind takes the surfaces and makes them texture. If I were to tell you it's spring, I'd be lying, uh, just to get you to conjure a certain brand of light. If I were to perform this in pearl buttons and my Montana boots, I'd be doing it to conjure the five fingers of whiskey, 14 hands of a horse of a motif. I imagine I'll die on a Friday. I mean, who can guess what days will be left? Who can hear in this heat or memory of heat? Be careful, this stranger in a dress says to Cindy at Shea Charlie. Be careful, she says, says Cindy at Shea Charlie, walking to the parking lot. For a minute, this stranger in a dress is my mother. And my mother is lost and just staring at me. I won't look away. Our eyes are a subscription and neither of us will cancel and every morning will be a lonely lawn waiting for the news to land. When I was younger, I almost pushed a friend, Dave, off a cliff. It was a joke, a foot from horror. This has been my entire adult relationship with myself. Dave's cousin, Paul, comes to town and reminds me that 20 years ago, he jumped out of our upstairs bathroom window. Swithin, the tree, already dead, catches fire proper. Earlier this afternoon, as I was feeding wiggling roaches pinched in my fingers to a dry old lizard, I thought of communion in the desert, the numbers 40 and 40, 
and temptation and sacrificing quarters to machines. Lately, I'm always drinking old cold coffee or cooled once hot tea. I'm slowly digging this hole in my forehead. It started as an old spot, a dry button, but it'll end a Sergio Leone horn section with strings. I can't stop picking and it can't stop singing. 20 years ago, Paul came in the front door looking shaken, both rattled and calmed by gravity. Oh, stupid calm. You can touch my hand, but you won't hold on to me as I undo. It's the difference between plucking an eyebrow and plucking an eye. Whatever that was, a drill, a frustrated raptor, a revving engine, an alarm, suddenly quiets. Stupid calm. I needed you to blind me.